you look in, if you look at my, uh, my class pictures from when I was a kid, um, in my class I was always one of the tallest kids. Um, I've always been a tall, I was always a tall kid, um, I've always been a tall compared to my friends and people around me, um, but I was always a tall kid. And what that meant was, is that every time as a kid, I would go somewhere with my mom and dad and they would introduce me to a friend of theirs or, an, a, you know, someone that, an acquaintance or somebody from their past, and they would introduce me as their son. About half of the time I would get this comment and it was a very, very untrue statement. He must be really good at basketball. It was always the first thing that somebody would say, man, look at his height. He must be really good at basketball. Um, I am not good at basketball. I'm actually pretty horrible at basketball. I'm too slow, can't shoot, can't jump. So you're not going to be very good. Um, one of my biggest things, I, I, because I was a, a tall kid, I, I decided to try basketball. And when I, when I got on the court, what I realized very, very quickly was that I was not aggressive enough at all for basketball. Same reason why I never played football. I am not aggressive. Somebody once said, why don't you play football? I said, because some, they're going to tell, they're going to put me on defense and they're going to say, go tackle that guy. I'm going to say, why? He didn't do nothing to me. I'm not, a, I'm, I wasn't an aggressive person. It just, it just wasn't in me. Um, baseball, you can be passive aggressive, but instead I was playing basketball and, or football that you have to be aggressive. You have to fight with people for the ball. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I wasn't aggressive. I, I think one was I was afraid to get hit in the face. Because um, whenever you jump up for a ball and you got a bunch of hands flying around, you're the tall kid, wow, you get slapped upside the head, right? Uh, so I think that was part of it. Uh, I think part of it was I didn't know how to work as a team with the other four players on the court. Um, so I was kind of by myself watching my team play, not realizing, oh, I need to be the one under the basket. Instead, I like to be kind of hanging out by the three-point line, and I couldn't shoot, right? It didn't help. Um, and then finally, I never believed that I could really be a good basketball player. Like, there was something in me that said, you know what, you're not, I'm not going to, I might be taller than everybody, and the one kid, I might be able to hold the ball above their head. But for the most part, I never believed, I never played with, like, the reckless abandon I needed to, to be a good basketball player. Those three things, right, uh, my lack of belief, my, my lack of courage, and my lack of being able to work in a unified, you know, team, um, kept me from being a good basketball player. There was no chance that I was going to be able to be a good ball player. In our, in our gospel today, um, now, I'm going to get to those three things in a little bit, but in our gospel today, we have a very, very popular, a very, very powerful gospel that every Catholic has heard and understands and, and really holds on to. Because it's the moment whenever Jesus basically establishes Peter as the foundation of the church. He establishes him as the first pope. That this is going to be your role. That we're going to build this house, I'm going to build my kingdom on you. That you're the rock, the foundation. Now, there's a few things, there's a lot of theology, there's a lot of beautiful stuff that comes from that, but I want to focus on one in particular phrase that he uses. And I think it'll not only answer why I'm not, what, why I could, what, what, what it meant to be a good basketball player, but it also means what it means for us to be a good Christian. See, he says, your name is not Simon Peter anymore, it's Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So he's basically saying, I'm going to build a family, I'm going to build a collective, I'm going to build a church on you. The following phrase is very interesting though. He says, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. So you hear this, that there's these two teams going on. That Peter's the captain of one of the teams and, and the apostles are right there with him and, and they're going to work together and the gates of the netherworld, this other team of the netherworld, when he uses that phrase netherworld, it can be translated in a lot of different ways. In the Old Testament we hear Sheol, we hear Hades, we hear, some people say hell, which isn't really the best idea, but what it's really saying is that the gates of death, the gates of the realm of the dead, will not prevail against my, uh, my team. What Jesus is saying, He's saying there's the gates of death against the church that I'm building on Peter. Now the interesting phrase, part of that phrase 
is gates. Think about it. There's a gate of death. There's, a, a gate is, is something that closes, that locks, that holds people in. Right? I think there's a misconception in our world today, and I think this is a misconception that's very, very, very widely accepted by Christians, and myself included. I, I fall into this kind of concept, this idea, that with all the craziness going on in the world, that the church has to be basically this just self-sustaining kind of thing. Basically, we're like a turtle hiding in our shell that anything coming from the world just deflects off. That we're being attacked by ideologies. We're being attacked by political movements. We're being attacked by sin. We're being attacked constantly. And we just have to fend it off. And just hope to survive. But I, don't, I think that's a massive misconception if we really look at what Jesus is saying about these two teams today. Because when Jesus is talking about these two teams, gates don't attack. Gates hold in. Gates keep captives. But gates are never on the offensive. They're on the defensive. Think about that. Whenever we think of sin, we use this phrase, we use a phrase in the church a lot, slavery to sin. The shackles that someone is that someone's bound to their sin. Someone's struggling with their sin. They're stuck in their sin. And Jesus is saying that my church, built on the foundation of Peter, with the power to bind in heaven and to loose on earth and all these things, my church is going to go in and attack the gate. That my church is meant to be on the offensive. My church is meant to be going out. My church is meant to be an aggressive church that's going to attack the ball, if you will. I think the same stuff that kept me from being a good basketball player seems to be the same stuff that oftentimes keeps us from living out and being a church on the offensive. Like I said, I, I, I was afraid to get slapped in the face. My fear kept me timid on the court, kept me leaning back, kept me, kept me away from the action that was going on. In our church, does our fear keep us where we're comfortable in the church? Where we're comfortable in the building? We're comfortable at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning because we're surrounded by a bunch of people that know us and like us and think like us and possibly look like us and act like us. Or it, it, because sometimes the, the comfort of it can lead to, I'm afraid to go out from this. I'm afraid to go out from my cocoon. I'm afraid to go out from the shell or out from the castle and to go and to spread the gospel with reckless, aggressive abandon. The same way. As one of the things that I couldn't do, it was really hard for me to play as, five, as one of five people on a team. Because I was so worried about myself, I was so worried about self-preservation, I was so worried about getting slapped in the face or, or getting hurt, that my teammates around me kind of got lost in the shuffle. In the same way. It's really easy for us a lot of times. I, I, I know for myself, it's really easy for me to stand up and to look around and to see, you know, a lot of people looking and thinking like me and acting like me and thinking, oh man, I'm looking forward to Father's got to say for his homily. It's really easy to be able to do this, but it's really hard whenever we come face to face with our family members. It can get really hard or really anxious. We can get really anxious whenever it's time for us to. To, to, to be a Christian at work. It's really hard all of a sudden when I'm in school and people are being bullies to somebody and it's not the popular thing to go and be on their side because my friends are going to kind of push me away. And don't worry, that stops because we all know that stops though at elementary school. That kind of stuff never happens when you get older, right? Sarcasm. 
It's really hard sometimes whenever the world around me isn't looking and, and holding to the same ideals or really excited about the same stuff I am, and all of a sudden I can find myself alone. We, rely, we can rely on the unity a little bit too much sometimes. But while we're supposed to be unified as we go out, a lot of times we're not unified even within. Because, this, because sometimes this group don't talk to that group, and, it, and these people don't like those people. And you know what? There's those priests that wear those certain kind of color vestments or colors. I like that same kind of, that kind of music. And you know what? That ain't what the church needs to be. A lot of times there can be infighting even within our own church. How big of a scandal is it that when we say the word Christian, we could mean 35,000 denominations? That's a massive scandal to the world. But we're supposed to be unified. Following one God, one Jesus. One Lord, one Savior, one baptism, one, one place where we come to receive Him. Called to be unified. Third thing, I, I, you know what, quite honestly for me, I didn't believe that I was going to be able to be a good basketball player. In, in my, in, deep down in my heart of hearts, no matter how much I practiced, I didn't believe that I was going to be a good basketball player at the end. So you know what? There was no way that I was going to put in the things that I needed to to really push forward being a good basketball player. I didn't believe in the cause, and I didn't believe in the outcome. I didn't believe in the cause that I was going to be a good ball player, and I didn't believe in the outcome that we were going to win a whole lot of games. It was really just something to pass the time. In the same way, do we, as a Christian faithful, do we believe in a cause? Do we believe in the faith that we proclaim? In a few minutes, we're going to stand up and we're going to say the creed. And just like we do on Sunday, every week, we're going to stand up and say the creed. And a lot of times, I know myself included, I can stand up and quite honestly, when I stand up to say the creed, a lot of times, that's the point whenever I wipe my eyes, I start thinking about what my homily was, what I want to tweak for 11 o'clock, like all those kind of things start passing through because I don't, because a lot of times I can fall into the stream of just words instead of really reflecting on what is it that I'm saying I believe. Do we believe the words that we state? Do we believe in the faith that we're going to proclaim in a few minutes? Do we believe in the God? In the cause. Secondly, do we believe in the outcome? Because if Jesus is saying, I'm going to establish a church, and this church is going to go into the gates of death, they're going to destroy them and pull people out of sin, pull people out of death, give people hope for the resurrection in the future. If that's what Jesus is saying, and we believe that He accomplished that on the cross, do we believe that we've already won? Do we believe that the outcome of this Christian history of our life is that we will be with God one day? Despite whatever trials we have waiting for us in the world. Despite the pettiness of an election, despite the, the two storms that seem to be bearing down on us next week, do we believe that in the end, God wins? And that if I'm faithful, that I'll see Him that I'll be with Him. And it's not because of me and what I've done. It's not because I'm better than anybody else. It's because Jesus Christ had mercy on me. And I'm, sa I'm saved because of it. Courage, unity, and belief. I'm, I'm, you know that I'm a sports fan. I, one of my favorite things to watch is a good upset whether it be Alabama losing all the time. It's so beautiful, right? I, I love a good upset. And one of the things is, is that on a good upset, we have, you, have, you see a team that has courage. You see a team that has unity and works together. You see team, a team that believes that they can win from the go. And they don't stop. They never stop. They never pick up and just put it into auto. They never put it into autopilot. They continue to push forward. They continue to remain aggressive. 
In the same way, some of the greatest battles in the history of humanity, some of the greatest battles that have happened, some of the biggest upsets that happened on the battlefield of war have been because a, tr a group of troops truly believed they could win. They had courage in the eyes, in the face of trial, and they were unified as brothers in arms, brothers and sisters in arms, against whatever it was holding them back. We as Christians are called to do the same thing. And if the gates of death are a defensive position, we're called to be on the offensive. We're called to be aggressive. Every time I say that, I think of the be aggressive. I'm sorry. Anyway, we're called to be on the offensive. We're called to go and get. At the end of the Mass, the last words that the deacon is going to say is going to be, go and proclaim the Gospel. Go. Get out. If that drives us into a place of anxiety, it drives us into a place of fear, great, let's pray for courage. If it, we feel like we're completely alone in what we're doing, great, let's, let, let's do our absolute best to find the community who's going to strengthen us. If we have a struggle of our belief, great, then let's ask the Lord, let's learn what we need to about our faith, let's ask the Lord for the theological virtue of faith. Because if we're going to be the church that Jesus is saying He's building on the shoulders of Peter today, we have to be aggressive. We have to go out. We cannot be a church that looks like a turtle in a shell, hiding and scared. We have to be on the offensive. And today, as we come to receive, this, receive the sacrament, we come, as we come to Mass, May we be strengthened for that journey. You know, we receive this food because it's meant to sustain us. It's meant to send us out. It's meant to, be, to reveal to us how much God loves us and how much we're then supposed to, supposed to give and love others. But today, as we come to receive this sacrament, as we come before our Lord, very simply, let's pray to have an, a faith that's alive. A faith that's aggressive. Faith that is on the offensive.